I'd ask you now to please rise as we start our service out with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Amen. So this morning, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides your beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Beloved, we are God's children, and Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, you are forgiven. By Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you, call, you are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promise prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. Our opening hymn. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. From the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Join with me now with our prayer of the day. Righteous God, our merciful Master, you own the earth and all its people and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom, and prepare us for the joy of the day of your coming. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for our first reading. The first reading this morning comes from Zephaniah, chapter 1, 7, verses 12 through 18. Zephaniah presents the day of the Lord as one of judgment and wrath. Descriptions of the last day in the New Testament include details taken from the Old Testament accounts of the day of the Lord. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs. Those who say in their hearts, 
The Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his passion, the whole earth shall be consumed. For a full, a terrible end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. We now speak the psalm responsively. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. You turn us back to the dust and say, Turn back, O children of earth. You sweep them away like a dream. They fade away suddenly like the grass. For we are consumed by your anger. We are afraid because of your wrath. When you are angry, all our days are gone. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. Who regards the power of your wrath? Who rightly fears your indignation? The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 11. Though we do not know and cannot calculate the day of Christ's return, we live faithfully in the here and now as we anticipate the day when we will be given eternal salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. The word of the Lord. I invite you to stand for the hearing of God's word. The Holy Gospel, according to Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 14 to 30. In our gospel, Jesus tells a parable about his second coming, indicating that it is not sufficient to merely maintain things as they are. Those who await 
his return should make good use of the gifts that God has provided them. Our reading. Jesus said to his disciples, For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to invest, have invested the money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord. It's so wonderful to see so many, uh, so many young, young people here, so just to take a moment for a children's message. I want, I want to ask you a question, and I don't want you to be shy. What are you good at? What are you good at? I know you're all proud of something that you know how to do. What is it? Yell it out. Gymnastics. Gymnastics. Now that is, that is impressive. That is something I am not good at. So I'm glad that you are. What else? Drawing? Art? See, that's the stuff I was good at. Art, drawing, creative stuff. Macy, I know you're good at a lot of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, you're being humble. We all have these gifts. Like, you know what a gift is, right? Like something that's been given to you. The stuff that we're good at. And I think we, all of us, all of us have them. We're good at gymnastics. We're talented artists. We have all, times of, all kinds of wonderful, wonderful gifts. Now, part of our lesson today from our gospel, one thing that Jesus is talking about is that a way for us to show God and to show Jesus that, that we love him is to use those gifts and continue to get good at them. Like when you're doing gymnastics, 
and you're getting really good at it, that's a way to show God that you love God because you're taking this gift and you're using it. When you're using, you're working with your art and you're getting really, really good at it, that is showing God that you love God because you're taking that gift and you're using it. It's like when, you're, like you're, when like your parents give you a gift, right? And then you take it and you love it and you play with it and you use it. It's the same idea. So that's something to think about when we talk about the gifts of God and the stuff that we're good at in our lives. Because when we use that stuff, no matter what it is, that is showing God. That is showing God worship and praise. That is showing God that, that we love God. And especially doing gymnastics, that is so cool. Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, thank you for all of your gifts. Thank you for leading us and guiding us during these strange times and help us to, to nourish, and to, nourish and to nurture the gifts that you have given us so we can use them to spread your good news throughout the world. Amen. I don't know if you've ever heard of something called the Peter Principle. I just learned about it myself. It's something that can be applied to, it's usually applied to work environments, but I think it can be applied to all other aspects of our day-to-day -day life. The idea behind the Peter Principle is that everyone is eventually promoted to a level of their own incompetence. Meaning as someone is climbing the ladder in work or in play, we all eventually reach the point where we are in over our heads. Just no longer good at what we're doing. And it's all about responsibility and navigating the responsibilities we're, we're given as as we grow and change in our lives. As I've heard it said, when much is given, much is expected. Or as a great man once said to Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. I guess you could call that the Peter Parker principle, if anybody gets that. It's what we do with that responsibility is what really matters, even if it leads to failure. Like with our par the parable of the talents that we heard today from Matthew 25, one of my very favorite lessons. There are so many layers in this one. And it's a lesson about what it means now that was funny. Yes. Siri is yelling at me. You get to go away. See, we all excel to the level of our own incompetence. Thanks, Siri. This is a lesson about what it means to have the gifts of God and what it means to use them in our own lives. In this parable, Jesus tells of a merchant, of a landowner, of a, of a master, who he goes on a journey. And as he leaves, he entrusts his property to his servants. To one servant, he gives five talents. To another servant, he gives two. And to another servant, he gives one. Now, in this context, you must understand that a talent was, um, it was an amount of property. It was a kind of currency. Um, it wasn't actually what you'd think of as, say, a gift or an ability, but it actually works very well both ways in this analogy. And in fact, if you think about it, one talent was the equivalent of 15 years worth of wages. So this was a lot of money that 
this master was entrusting to his servants. And when the master returned, he asked his servants, what did you do with the talents you received? Well, the first servant went to him and said, look, Master, look, I, I took these, these five talents. I traded with them. I made five more. And the other servant said, Me too. I went and I took these two talents. And I then went and made two more. But then, the last servant, who was given the one talent, he was too afraid to do anything with it. So afraid of failure that he buried it in the ground and he brought it to the master unused. Now the master, he was more than happy with the first two servants in the good work that they had done. But with that last servant, one could say he was less than pleased. As Jesus says, as for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So yeah, not pleased at all. Now what does all of this mean? Let's look at it, I'd like to look at this in another way. And in fact, look at our worship service and our worship experience as its own analogy for the life and the work of the church. Right here in this church, we have the servants of God and we have, and each one of them has any number of talents that as, we're, as we are worshiping, Pastor Tim comes before us with many talents, many talents with a lifetime of of experience in business as an educator and as a pastor. Clearly one with the most, really with the most talents here. But then at the same time, with those talents comes the most responsibility. And I come before you with my own talents as well. Not as many talents, but many that I am proud of, and also at the same time, not as much responsibility. And then I look around and I see others here. I see our acolyte, Paige. The talents you have been entrusted in as part of this worship service, they are numerous beyond counting because what we're doing here matters. And when you come forward and you assist during worship, it means more than you can possibly know. Or Asha, as you're helping us right now with our worship service. We couldn't have one without it. And often I think even many times, think of our young people who are considered to be the ones that in this point in their lives, they do at this moment have the fewest talents. Does it mean that those talents are not important? Does it mean that those talents are not going to eventually grow and multiply from one and then to two and then to five and then to 10, just like, just like the servants in this story? And we all have those talents. And what would happen if any one of us took those talents and buried them in the yard? Simply buried them out of fear. Feeling it was too much responsibility. What would happen what would this mean for the church? What would this mean for us as Christians? That rather than honoring these gifts, these talents that we receive from God, that instead 
we were to hide them and hide from them just because it felt like there was too much responsibility. Let's go back to the Peter principle for a second. Something that I will admit, yes, is very cynical. It is very cynical. The book that it comes from is cynical. But I want to look at it in a much more positive and optimistic light. That yes, it is true. Throughout all of our lives, every single one of us will grow and mature to a point of our own incompetence. It, what's, it's what it means to live a full life. We wouldn't be growing otherwise. We wouldn't be learning. That's the only way for a person to grow their gifts is to eventually get to a point where we are out of our depth and then be brave and keep going. No one is absolutely perfect with anything the first time they do it. But yeah, I've, I've never done gymnastics, but I bet if I tried and I worked at it, I could be pretty good. You never know. Gymnastics, music, art, finance. And yes, the more responsibility there is, the, scary, the scarier it can feel. Because when much is given, much is expected. And I know, but I know that if I had stuck only with things that I was good at, I would still be working at Starbucks rather than being brave and answering God's call in my life and embracing those gifts rather than burying them in the ground. You know, I think of those, the servant with the five talents. He went and he he invested them, he traded with them, and he earned five more. He could have easily lost them. He could have. But he was brave. He answered God's call and was able to multiply them, knowing that failure was an option. That's the only, doing that, that is the only way that we grow as human beings as we grow as a church. This is what I really do, I want to lift up, I really want to lift up Pastor Tim here for all of the brave work that he has done in these past months since the beginning of the pandemic. So many decisions, so many different things that le are left unknown and unsung. So many brave decisions to keep this congregation thriving and because of them we continue to persevere and thrive more than any church that I know what would have happened if he took in the taken those talents and buried them in the ground out of fear and he's not alone here we have so many in this congregation, that every decision they have made, whether they are on council, or whether they are our ushers, or they are just coming, everyone coming here to worship. This is saying, I am not going to take my faith and bury it. I'm not going to bury it and just wait until the chaos is over. Because if we do that, we will never grow. And we, if we do that, that is when fear takes over. You know, in our parable, Jesus mentions the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. For me, that is what happens when God gives us gifts and we hide them rather than embrace them. It's the torment of dreams unfulfilled. Burying those dreams in the ground out of fear of failure. 
our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He did not allow the burden of God's gifts to stop him from what he needed to do, specifically to die willingly on the cross. He didn't let fear take over, neither should we. And all of God's gifts are born of that one gift, the gift of our Christ. And I don't know where our talents are going to take us. It's part of the adventure. But when we bravely embrace the gifts of God and we use our gifts together, there is nothing that we cannot accomplish. So may the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds with Jesus, the Christ of God. Amen. Let us continue our worship now with our hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. I invite you to stand as you are able. Let us now profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord of the church, ignite your people with the passion of your love. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, unite us across ministries, congregations, and denominations, and refine us to participate in your activity throughout the world. Hear us, O God. Lord of creation, we stand in awe at the works of your hands and praise of your beauty, the beauty of nature. Bless the earth 
for your glory and restore its integrity where exploitation has caused ruin. Hear us, O God. Lord of the nations, send forth your justice in the ears of all leaders. Increase concern for those who are the most vulnerable and keep our soldiers safe. Hear us, O God. Lord of all in need, search out all who cry to you in distress. Scatter the heavy clouds of depression, chronic illness, unemployment, and loneliness with your radiant light. We pray especially for Connie Seidel, Pastor Marty and Lola Rugi, Claudine Ross, Tom Jones, Debbie Sheets, Gail McNeil, Dave McNeil, George and Verna Dabraki, Dan Compton, Brittany Ratchman, Russell Math, David Malky, and John Malky. Send us as encouragement and signs of your healing. Hear us, O God. Lord of the stranger, stir up holy restlessness in us to extend love to those at the margins. Release our desire for control and open us to learn from the perspectives of others. Hear us, O God. Lord of the living and the dead, we give you thanks for all the saints at rest from their labors. Rouse us to live by their example that saints yet to come may also know your love. Hear us, O God. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until the day when we all gather around your throne in everlasting light. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Wave to, no wave to one another in peace. Until the day that we can give one another hugs. We continue with our offertory prayer. God of all goodness, generations have turned to you. Gather around your table and share your abundant blessings. Number us among them, that as we gather these gifts from your abundance, if give thanks for your rich blessings, we may feast upon yourself and care for all you, you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and servant. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. As our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, gathered with his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. He blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Drink of it always, so that you may remember me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. 
Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given and shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. Lord Jesus, in this simple meal, you have set a banquet. Sustain us on the journey. Strengthen us to care for the least of your beloved children. And give us glad and generous hearts as we meet you on the way. Amen. May the God of all creation, in whose images we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service. Give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, sovereign Savior and Spirit, be with you today and always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our sending hymn is Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. Serve the Lord.